All right. Um, can we just like on the count of three clap? Sure. Okay. Three, two, one. Uh. What does it mean for a Pokemon team to be good? And how do the best Pokemon players put them together on their quest to become world champion? I'm Aaron Trailer, and alongside Wolf Glick, we're going to interview the world's best competitive Pokemon players in order to find out their perspectives on the complex game of VGC, Video Game Championships, the official Pokemon battling format. Today, I'm excited to announce that we're going to be interviewing Yuma Kinugawa, a Japanese player who just placed in the top 16 at the 2022 Pokemon World Championships. We're going to be doing this using translation. My friend Yuki Zeninovich is going to translate from English to Japanese and vice versa. And I'm really excited for this interview format. So welcome to Pokemon Perspectives. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Pokemon Perspectives, the podcast hosted by myself and Aaron Trailer, where we aim to interview some of the best Pokemon players and team builders in the world. Now, as you might imagine, many of the best Pokemon players in the world are from uh, a little country called Japan. And though we would love to interview them in English um, or with our uh, our Japanese, (laughs) it unfortunately is not good enough where... Uh, we can conduct that interview. <laughs> and so today I'm very excited to announce that we've actually brought on our good friend Yuki, who is fluent in both English and Japanese, to help us translate uh, an interview with one of the best Japanese players of all time. Yuki, how's it going? Good, Well, Thanks for having me. Yeah, you want to tell the people uh, a little bit about your yourself and your background in competitive Pokemon and anything you want to share with the class? Sure. Uh, so my name is Yuki Zaninovich. Uh, I've been playing VGC since uh, probably around 2017. I've played pretty casually for two years and then i really started taking a little bit more seriously in 2019 i think my notable accomplishments are making day two uh, at my first worlds in 2019 uh, and also getting uh 11th place at the oceania international championships in 2020 um doing uh, well in a couple of online events during the pandemic era after that mm-hmm. uh, i'm really passionate about kind of bridging the gap between uh western and japanese vuc so uh, i'm really, really excited to be on this podcast and even more to just be working with my good friends, Wolf and Aaron. I'm really glad that we got you on because I'm pretty interested in what you have to say. Um, And, you know, your take on the game as well, which uh, I hope we can talk a little bit about more at some point in the future. And I'm also really excited to be sort of bridging this gap between the non-Japanese speaking part of the world and the Japanese speaking part of the world, because (laughs) (laughs) like when you think about the strength of the player base in Japan, I don't think a lot of English speaking people really realize that there are a ton of very, very strong players in Japan. It's kind of hard to estimate because we don't know and only so many really make it to the world championships every year. But I would wager it's probably like the the depth of the field in Japan exceeds that of many countries. I'm just trying to figure out like whether it exceeds that of whole regions <laughs> of the rest of the world, you know? It, it probably it probably does. Japan in terms it of like probably the average player in, in any given region, I think Japan is the strongest and it's not even close. And uh not not to go off topic at all, but we should probably start getting a little concerned about that <laughs> given where uh the next <laughs> world location is. But yeah. I, that's that's a topic for another day. <laughs> yeah. I mean I think there's so many things about what make the Japanese circuit and the Japanese player base really difficult. But I mean, just to illustrate, like uh, I I actually moved to Japan about a year ago uh, from the U.S. So I was a uh, I was competing in the U.S. circuit before. Now I compete in the Japanese circuit, and I have to say that even some of just the grassroots local events, like the equivalent of like a Premier Challenger midseason showdown, you'd have in the U.S., Europe, uh, other regions. Mm-hmm. The level I've I've had way more difficult uh, tournaments just in these grassroots tournaments in Japan than I've had at some regionals and even some international uh, events I've been to. Uh, it is just crazy, like Wolf said, how high the skill is of the average player. I feel like talking about the differences between you know the North American, the European circuit, and the Japanese circuit, we could have a whole podcast devoted to that, and it would be pretty interesting. But <laughs> yeah. just just a little bit of background for listeners who might not be familiar. Let's say I'm an average player in Japan, and I want to qualify to the world championships. How do I do that? So it's a pretty arduous process. 
So the first step is to uh, join one of usually four to five online qualifiers. Uh, I think in the West, they're called international challenges, Mm -hmm. uh, where you just play like a ladder tournament for 45 matches. And based on how you rank against other players in the same region as you, uh, you can get some championship points, uh, which can help for your world qualification. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's a really nice thing to have and can really make a difference for your world qualification in the West. But over in Japan, it means something so much more. You have to get in the top 30 in Japan or in the top 60, if it's the last qualifier where all the marbles are, in order to get basically a qualification into nationals, the Japan Nationals Tournament. Uh, and that's not where it even ends. So usually there's four or five of these and about 100 to 150 players qualify for the Japan Nationals. But you don't have your world qualification yet. You have to attend the Japan Nationals after those qualifiers where you get in the top 30 or top 60 and you play six or seven rounds of Swiss. And they're all best of one. So mm-hmm. not the best of three that everyone's used to. It's best of one. So you might have some of the gimmicks or all the things that you know people are not really excited to see in best of one. You have to play that and you have to go positive. So you have to go four wins, two losses, four wins, three losses to even stand a chance to uh, get your world's invite. Mm-hmm. If you get unlucky and you're the you know lowest, uh, you know based off of the resistance, you might be the lowest ranked four wins and three losses. And you might still not get your invite. And then that's when you start to play in top cut and you can finally qualify for a day two invitation. But even just getting to have a chance at getting a day one invitation to Worlds is incredibly stressful because it all just boils down to how you perform on this one specific day in a best of one format. Yeah. I think it's worth noting. So for our listeners who maybe aren't, maybe maybe you watch more Pokemon than you play. Mm-hmm. The difference between best of one tournament and best of three is astronomical. Yeah. Because, I mean, it makes sense in that best of one, especially at the highest level, which is not, nor- most of the time that I'm playing best of one, it's on the ladder where players are, you know, maybe testing things, maybe not playing at their most serious. It's a very different beast altogether than when you're playing for all the marbles. Because in best of one, all it takes is one cleverly revealed surprise, one unorthodox tech, like all these things that you can use to catch your opponent off guard and you can easily put the match in a position where the opponent can't come back from and so because of that players who are, who are attempting to qualify via this structure are heavily rewarded for using things that are unorthodox and that the opponent hasn't prepared against and when the whole field is doing that it makes it extremely volatile because you don't have time to adapt you know it's not like oh I lost a game to this but now I know how like what it is what it does and I can adapt and win it's like oh I lost a game to this like that's it <laughs> you know so yeah. uh, it's it's very I, I, I did not like playing best of one it was extraordinary stressful back when our circuit was best of one and the fact that Japan still uses a best of one is I am very grateful that is not our circuit as well because it is not a fun format to play it's very stressful I have to say that even playing in those ladder tournaments is not especially very fun if you need that placing. Mm -hmm. If you need to place in the top 30, that can't be any fun at all. 45 games in one weekend is a lot, especially when they're best of one. It's a lot of Pokemon. Yeah, so it's really just a struggle. Yeah, totally. And I mean, you know, just with all the different factors involved, whether it's that you have to play best of one in both the qualification to nationals as well as at nationals itself, like, the fact that you have to go through two tournaments that are best of one, can, you can kind of guess that there's going to be a lot of variance in like how people can perform year over year. Like I would love to be able to say some statistic off the top of my head of how consistent some players can you know qualify for day one every year, or even day two. Like I think there's a lot of players in Europe or US who consistently make uh, the day two start at Worlds every year. However, in Japan, I think it's really really difficult. Like I think there's only oh, man, I, yeah, I can't. I don't want to make up any statistics, but it's it's really really hard to be able to make it to a day two invite at Japan Nationals for two consecutive years in a row. I think there's only been uh, a handful of players who have ever done that. So it's just an incredibly, incredibly hard format to be consistent in, which is why the most consistent players in the Japan National Circuit also happen to be most consistent in the world stage as well. It's also worth noting just really quickly that let's say you're a Japanese player and you want to go for day two specifically. Once you get through the best of one Wi-Fi qualifier and the best of one Swiss portion of the event, then the top cut portion of the event is all best of three. So you can't even just have a team that is all like only good at best of one if you're trying to get day two. You need to also have a, like your team be able to perform well in best of three. Though it's the less important thing because it's more important to qualify. But if you know you can't come to the US or, or London or whatever because like you need like without a paid trip, like it puts players in a really difficult spot. Yeah. Um, just wanted to add that really quickly. 
Yeah, so today we're going to be talking to Yuma Kinugawa. We just call him Kinugawa mostly, that's his handle. It's worth noting as well that he is one of the most revered Japanese team builders. Mm -hmm. He is known for some really unusual, really unorthodox Pokemon, which we'll talk a little bit about with him. Um, and even like mm -hmm. even some like some Pokemon that he's used on streams or in tournaments, other players have used to great success as well. I think notably in, was it 2017, a player top four of the World Championships with hit one of his Pokemon? Am I remembering that correctly? Correctly. Yeah, both 2017. I was thinking about the Nihilego, actually. 2017 and 2018, two consecutive years in a row, yeah. Yeah, so we'll have to ask him about that. Yeah, for sure. One last thing before we go get Kinugawa. Uh, Yuki is um, going to be translating all of Kinugawa's answers into English, so that's what you all will be hearing. Mm -hmm. um, so type thank you, Yuki, in the comments. Do podcasts even have comments? No, they do. They do. Can we get some thank you Yuki's in the comments. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I don't I don't know exactly how much of Kinugawa's voice you'll be hearing, but if you are bilingual like Yuki, I think at some point the goal is to get a Japanese version of the podcast out so you can hear things more directly. But um, yeah, we have been putting a lot of <laughs> extra work on our <laughs> on our audio editor, so um, <laughs> that's probably probably not in the super near future. Yeah, yeah, maybe not until we like fly him out. Yeah, <laughs> to Hawaii to for the studio <laughs> to our studio in Hawaii. <laughs> 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 Cool. All right. Let's go talk to Kinagawa. I like the phrasing of let's go because it's like it's like we're going to the other room. You know what I mean? Like. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Uh, today we are joined by Kinugawa. Thank you for the, coming to the podcast. Yeah, yeah. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs> No problem. How long have you been playing VGC? 2014. He said he's been playing since 2014. Wow. So it sounds like you've been playing for, for a while. That is certainly longer than most of the player base nowadays. What has kept you motivated to consistently play like all the way since 2014, coming up on a decade? He says he just really simply enjoys competing, so that's his biggest reason to keep playing. Mm, Got it. Cool. I mean, <laughs> I feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you've had some really great results in the Japan circuit, and you've qualified for Worlds several times, and you've ended first on Battle Stadium a bunch of times. But you've also performed well at International Challenges and Worlds, such as when you got 11th at the 2016 London International Championships. The Japan circuit outside of the best of three at Japan Nationals focuses on best of one and international challenges and worlds focus on best of three. So how does that change your approach in team building or playing between the two different styles of battling? Or do you approach them the same way? The point that are similar is that he really wants to think about like what are the common threats and overall problems that there are in a given rule set and then trying to come up from the team building stage of how to address those. Like the approach overall is the same of just having a really strong game plan against the popular uh, teams, but in best of one, he makes a really intentional inclusion of not even necessarily like niche Pokemon, but uh, niche moves or ways of, of, of raising the Pokemon uh, to catch the opponent off guard in the best of one. Would you say that the goal is to subvert your opponent's expectations? <laughs> it's not that he's necessarily intentionally doing that, but if he can get that as sort of a byproduct, then it mm. increases the chances of winning. If the goal, so Kinugawa mentioned that he he likes to inclu intentionally include surprising, not necessarily Pokemon, but especially moves, items as well, I would assume falls under that category. Mm -hmm. But if, it, if the goal is not to subvert the opponent's expectations, what explicitly is the goal of including these unorthodox move choices, Pokemon choices, etc., if it's, if it's not to subvert expectations? Well, yeah, but... Yeah, he says it's kind of like a prisoner's dilemma situation where everybody is including some kind of like twist in their teams to like deviate from, uh, I guess, the status quo. So in order to sort of keep up with that, uh, that's why he has some unorthodox picks in uh, best of one. 
oh, that is not what I expected. That is really interesting. Whoa. Because, you know, I think of Inugawa as such a creative team builder and, and so a North Rock is so creative and, and so willing to use these off the wall things. And to hear that it's kind of just like, I, I don't necessarily want to, but I feel like I have to. Like, it's just not the answer I, I expected, but it, it makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Aaron. You can you can uh, ask the next question. I know you, what you've been sitting on. Um. Kinagawa-san, how would you describe yourself as a team builder? Like, what is your team building style? What are some things that you like including on teams? Uh, are there specific moves that you like having on teams? Just like generally speaking. That's interesting. He says that he hasn't really noticed any kind of trends or you know overall commonalities in how he builds teams. He says he tends to gravitate towards trick room, but that's definitely not what he always does necessarily. So um, I think I find that quite interesting because there is quite a lot of variety in the team that he uses. Uh, even if you just look at what he uses on ladder and also what he has brought to uh, you know live competitions, sort of he. He can do it all. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool. I like that answer. I like that answer too. He's not uh he's not limited. That's really cool. Um cool. So obviously Kunogawa has used a lot of creative Pokemon, no notably Choice Band Dragonite in 2017 at Worlds to get day two, Future Sight Mewtwo at 2019 uh Japan Nationals to qualify for Worlds, and then most recently Tickle Whimsicott at the 2022 World Championships to Cop Cut. These are all really incredible performances as well as really unique choices in team building. But however, there have also been other instances where other people have made deep runs with Pokemon that Kinogawa has uh kind of innovated and come up with. Some notable ones being Super Bulky Nihilego by uh, Tomoyuki Yoshimura to top four worlds in 2017, and then also Competitive Gothitel, which is not a standard uh, ability <laughs> on it by any means to our listeners, uh, by Yusuke Matsuno to top four worlds in 2018. So I guess what I'm wondering is, did these happen because you like told them to use it? You were like, hey, these are really strong. Or did they like decide that it was good after seeing you use it kind of independently? And then I have a follow-up, but we'll start with that because that was a lot. Oh, so he says that in, in general, people who just kind of observe him using these, uh, you know, really unique Pokemon and sets and kind of have their own success, like they don't really come up to them, Kinugawa, uh, for, uh, you know, advice necessarily. Like you know, even uh, Yusei Matsuno is a person he's, uh, you know, personally pretty friendly with, but it's not like they actually work on a team together. So, um, you know, he's always really surprised when these things happen because oftentimes the people who are really making these deep runs with his Pokemon have really, really like high quality teams that they end up in. That's really interesting. Um, are there any examples of times where a player, that, like a different player used one of your Pokemon, um, like one of your sets, but in a way that you hadn't considered before? So he says that a really specific example was when, when Tomoki Yoshimura actually used the really bulky Nihilego to make top four at World 2017. Um, like Hinugawa used that Nihilego to uh, qualify for the Japan Nationals that year, like he's in the online um, competition. And he really just believed that that would be a best of one oriented Pokemon, but mm -hmm. it wouldn't really survive. It's not flexible enough to survive in the best of three format. So he was really impressed with how uh, Tomoki Yoshimura used it in the you know very best of three format of worlds to make it to top four got it that makes a lot of sense that's really interesting thank you this is interesting because i remember uh, a really similar sentiment being shared in kind of the reverse where a western player took a uh, a japanese team to succeed in like a best of three environment despite it being made for best of one uh, the example i can think of is when marcus statter used <laughs> the um a uh Smeargle? choice scarf Smeargle team yep um i think the original <laughs> the original user really didn't have that much faith in using Using it so they actually didn't really bring it to any foreign tournaments or western tournaments that were best of three but you know obviously marcus piloted all the way to top eight at nationals in 2017 so i think it's quite interesting that this seems to happen both ways yes 100 yes. just as a fun note for our listeners who are probably not familiar with that team it was um normal normalium z conversion porygon z oh yes so the idea was <laughs> um <laughs> porygon z has adaptability and what would happen is you would use the choice scarf smear goal with either fake out or spore to like take out the more threatening pokemon and then z conversion and porygon z z conversion raised all of your stats by one so porygon z would 
use Z conversion, boost all of its stats by one, including its special attack uh, and speed and its bulk. So it was like hard to remove. Uh, and and because of adaptability, it basically Thunderbolt was one shotting like any because it was it was it would sorry and it would turn into the electric type. So because it would like have adaptability and the plus one boost, it would end up becoming so powerful that like it would pretty much KO any Pokemon that didn't resist electric with Thunderbolt. It was really strong. <laughs> it was a really, really cool team and not something that people had been using before then. So yeah, that's the context for that. Yeah, thanks for the context there. So I yeah, I think it's cool to see that this is repeated um in you know multiple formats uh, across BGC. Yeah, one hundred percent. You've been playing for quite a while, but it feels like you've had sort of an upwards trajectory recently during the Sword and Shield era, where you got first at the 2020 Liberty Note Nationals, top four at the 2021 Japan National Championships, and then you top cut Worlds just a couple of months ago. Do you think that there was something that you started to do different recently? Was there, what do you think is the biggest contributor making this happen? Was there like an aha moment where you did something new? Yeah, he believes that nothing really significant has changed for him, but I mostly just about building experience and getting used to playing in uh, you know bigger scale tournaments, and also just having uh, self confidence in playing has really been uh, instrumental for his success recently. That makes a lot of sense. I feel like those are really important parts of the game. Yeah, I, I think I think that it's something underrated, which I think is. Just a little comment on this, which is that, like, I think that Pokemon is a really difficult game. And I think something that I personally, I think, have a lot of work to do on is there's kind of two major components between your, like, battling skill to really oversimplify it. And they are, in my opinion, like, your your peak skill, like, how far, or, like, how good you are when you're playing close to your best. And then your average, which is, like, how, where, like, in the range of, like, I'm playing at a 10 out of 10 today versus a 1 out of 10 today, like, where you typically fall and so like players with peak skill like even if you're the best in the world when you're at your best if you can't access that most of the time then it's actually like it's not the only component so i think that experience and dealing with the pressure and like yeah just just learning more about how to actually like compete is a really big deal so i'm not surprised to hear that um the extra experience and the extra confidence is the major determining factor in, in kanugawa's opinion yeah yeah, I uh, think he really appreciates it and that uh, he really thinks self confidence was, was really helpful and that uh, he hopes it carries him through to uh, Scarlet and Violet. Yeah, we'll, we'll absolutely be rooting for him and, and looking forward to seeing what other like, cool teams he comes up with. Um, I want to shift gears just a little bit because something that I learned recently is that Kinugawa is doing YouTube, like Japanese YouTube, full time, if, if I'm not much mistaken. Is that correct? Yep, that's right. Cool. First of all, congratulations. That's a big step. And it's it's great to see um, more people in VGC able to do that. Something that I think is really interesting is that there's these things called RTAs, which are a like kind of streaming challenge where you can't turn off the stream until you hit a certain number of wins, uh, normally 50 or 100, which is uh, a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but they, they weren't really a concept. And po- despite Pokemon honestly being pretty well set up for them, like given the format of the game and the ladder and stuff, they weren't really done at all in the VGC community uh, until you went fire role for doing a hundred wins two days in a row um <laughs> did that like how did that help uh, increase your youtube fan base he says that originally he was not very well known or recognized uh you know youtuber in general but after doing something that is quite inhumane uh, he felt like it uh, you know <laughs> helped really increased his fan base and then also uh you know really spread the word of, of vgc which he's really really happy about yeah, it's an, it's honestly like after reading this, I was kind of conceptualizing if I myself would ever consider doing this. And oh my god, no! <laughs> I would not want to do it. Is my current feeling. Um, I mean, part of this challenge is that it's playing. I think you know, in a tournament in a single day, you could you'll probably play twenty to thirty games, and that is an immense amount, right? Like that mm-hmm. feels like a and it's it's on the lower side of that, right? If you two o all your opponents in a nine or go o two all of your opponents, um, in a nine run tournament, that's eighteen games. It's between eighteen and twenty seven. So the average is probably like 23, 24. So and that feels like a lot. So to, con- to do four times that two days in a row is genuinely unthinkable. Like, I think I would simply melt. Um, but my question is, you know, doing this kind of challenge, did that did that help your stamina at all? Did it, did it, did it make these kind of long tournament days seem shorter in comparison? Ah, uh, He says that uh, usually doing 100 wins takes about 30 hours at minimum. Oh. So any kind of uh, you know Western tournament feels like a piece of cake in comparison. So psychologically, <laughs> it's helping a lot. 
<laughs> Maybe I should do one of these in that case. <laughs> what does is, what is RTA stand for? Real time. Real time attack. Real time attack. Real time attack. Yes. Sounds like a real time attack to me. Yeah. Attack on your brain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> attack on all of you in honesty. I like, yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, has any other aspect of being an active VGC YouTuber helped you as a player? Uh, yeah, he says that uh, ever since he started YouTube and, uh, you know, becoming a bigger presence, uh, it's only, he, he's really appreciated all the support and fans that he's gotten, and that's made it so that it's basically impossible for him to quit VGC anytime soon and to, <laughs> yeah, just uh, keep uh, playing at a high level. Cool. I, I want to go just a little bit off script here. I guess what I'm curious about, this is a small question, but since, you know, going viral and developing a fan base, because this is something that I experienced, has the tournament experience, like going to these live events, has that changed significantly for uh, Kinugawa? Like, is it very different now than it was before he was making content? Or is it, does it still feel similar? He definitely appreciates being, you know, called on by fans and talking to them at live events. But unfortunately, he's become big uh, really after the uh, pandemic era. So uh, sometimes it feels hard for him to uh, notice any kind of difference uh, just because most of his uh, experience recently has been on online, not offline. That makes a lot of sense. I realized after asking that that might be the case. But OK, yeah, thank you very much. Maybe that's something else to look forward to in Scarlet and Violet. Yeah. He said he'd also love to go to uh, Western tournaments as well. Mm. We would love to have you. Yeah, we'd love to see you at more tournaments for sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I guess also going off script here, uh, do you have any plans going forward for Scarlet and Violet? No. Wow, so this is a breaking news, actually. He has never really talked about this publicly, but he is actually moving in with Kiwamu Endo, <gasps> known as Alkana, to work on Pokemon full-time, which is huge, huge news. This actually means that all of Team Umbra, which is the uh, esports organization that Kinugawa is part of, will be full of three full-time VGC YouTubers. Wow. Um, and yeah, he says that they're really just putting their all out to get really high results results at the uh, next World Championships, which happens to be uh, in a uh, home territory in Yokohama. That's incredible. Wow. That is really exciting news. Um, and, and congratulations as well. <laughs> that's really exciting because I'm a huge fan of all three players, but as a competitor, that's scary, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually quite monumental, I think, right? Because I don't think we've actually ever had an esports organization with more than two. Like, I can think of when Wolf and uh, Aaron Zeng were on the same team, mm -hmm. but uh, I think this is the first time, yeah, that we've had three people, you know, fully committed to VGC on a team. So I think this is really, really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just joined Beast Coast actually, and they, we have me, Aaron, and, and James, but Aaron is also oh, like, okay. he just went to OA to business school. So it's not full time. You know what I mean? Mm, sure, sure. So to have three people fully, like, full time doing it is not only unprecedented, but monumental. And I think a great yeah. sign of, of things to come. Thanks. Thanks, we'll do our best. He says. You know, they got three guys, you got three guys. And, you know, maybe there can be some sort of collaboration. Some yeah. Sort of something. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He says, let's definitely do it. <laughs> what about a 100 win RTA? <laughs> ah, I, think I, I think I'm busy that day, actually. <laughs> joke. It's joke, joke. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> cool. So, your most viral moment, Kinugawa san, uh, was when you realized that the Indeedee that you used to win the 2020 Liberty Note Grassroots National Tournament actually had the wrong nature. In America, we've had this a couple times where, uh, for example, Ashton Cox and Jeremy Rodriguez both made the finals at the 2018 Memphis Regionals with Max Attack Lunala. There are several other silly examples, but that's very funny for stuff. But how much does changing EVs or optimizing for nature really matter in VGC, in your opinion, from your perspective? He says that usually these kind of uh, you know, mistakes and how to raise Pokemon for the team is pretty fatal. Um, and he thinks that he got pretty lucky in how that happened. So in his case, the Ndidi was a little bit uh, faster than it should be. And he also, I think, uh, had a mistake on his dust pops. Like it was a little bit more bulky on the defensive side rather than the specially defensive side. Um, so the, the kind of the, the extent of his mistake was like forgivable. Whereas 
he's quite shocked and in awe to hear about what happened with Ashton Cox because he thinks that that's a pretty uh, you know fatal mistake. Yeah, that was a wild thing to watch. I actually want to just give a little bit of fun fact to our listeners here. I actually made a mistake like this in my first year playing VGC. It wasn't quite as significant as what Ashton and Jeremy did, but I was running a, a, a very heavy Trick Room team. The entire strategy was focused around Trick Room going up. Um, and Kofagrigus, my main Trick Room setter, was missing, I believe it was, I think either like 32 or 60 HP EVs. Like when I'd been EV trading, they somehow ended up an attack. And I didn't realize until not only after I won regionals, but I also won nationals with like <laughs> and, and in Kofagrigus, like its base HP is really low. So like those points mattered a lot like <laughs> so it's just like and I didn't even realize until uh yeah like it was like the day of worlds and, and I was showing a friend like my team and they were like oh you're not running a max HP Kofagrigus and I was like ah I'm supposed to be so <laughs> yeah that's my little fun fact where I've also done done something similar to also win nationals actually he says that it's interesting that like there was seems to like a, be a parallel situation between you two. And one follow up that he has is in top cut in that nationals two years ago when he played against Stoma. Actually, uh, his dust clops like barely survived uh, like a max move from the uh, opposing Gyarados, and because he basically got saved by the fact that uh, he was more defensively bulky than specially defensively, he thinks that maybe uh, you know optimizing your spreads is actually not that important and uh you know you can kind of just do whatever you want and get away with it <laughs> i think maybe it depends on on the strength of the player maybe kunugo is like so good that like it's okay for him to like be missing some stat points but for someone like me i don't think that i should be losing any stats <laughs> <laughs> i guess i agree though like for my own personal philosophy on pokemon like the evs that you choose are kind of in the long run mostly the little details don't matter as much something like ashen's lunala that matters a lot but um <laughs> it's more about what you want to do with the pokemon the decisions that you're making in the battle mm. yeah he agrees with uh your sentiment that uh in general like pokemon you need to have them uh you know play a specific role uh, on a team but uh for that team specifically he kind of just decided the spreads on the fly so it just ended up working out for him yeah, that makes sense. I will say that that actually what Aaron just said is one area I think where we do disagree a little bit where like I do think that the specific details of the spreads can matter a lot. But just because Pokemon can sometimes be a game of inches, I do agree that in, in a lot of cases, the specific calcs don't end up coming up. But I've definitely been saved a couple times by like some important spreads. So I think that's another thing that's cool is just that like, you know, Aaron and I work super closely together. Like, um, you know, we've been playing together for like over a decade. And yet, despite that, we still like have some fundamental like differences in our in our approach to the game, which I just think is cool cool in general. Yeah, I definitely think that's true. And I think uh, Kinugawa has like a similar setup as well, right? Like he has his own kind of like, you know, trio of uh, players that he works closely with. Um, so actually, I, I like to kind of follow up with him on that and ask if he has any kind of yeah differences um, in how he makes teams with his teammates. Yeah, that'd be great. Ah, that's right. Wolf type at the one with you. He says that you know his teammates, uh, both Shoma and, and um, Alkana, they are more like you, Wolf. They, uh, you know, they really are really precise to the the very number on the on the spreads. Whereas he's kind of more like Aaron in terms of just kind of going and winging it. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. But I kind of want to dig deeper and ask them. You know, is there any kind of more fundamental differences in how they come up with teams? Like even before you decide on the spreads, which is you know kind of something that happens uh, in the later stages of team building for players. Like, is there anything more fundamental? mental that's different between them and uh, he brought a really good example about his team for uh, 2022 worlds uh, where they both use a uh, zashin kai ogre team um, you know they ended up uh you know falling on a pretty unconventional whimsicott that uses tickle uh, but it seems like kinugawa actually wanted to do something even more drastic so uh, his example was that he actually wanted to use a metal burst stable eye first oh wow <laughs> in that slot but then uh you know uh, kiwamu is a player who doesn't really like to use anything unconventional in that way especially in the pokemon level so he just said yeah uh, if you're gonna do that like we should just part ways you just do your own thing so uh he says he uh, reluctantly went with the ones that caught <laughs> <laughs> for those who are unaware because it's not a move that most people are experienced with metal burst is a similar it's the third move of mirror coat encounter but instead where those moves will do double damage when they take a physical and special attack uh, for counter and mirror coat respectively metal burst always works um but it does 1.5 damage instead 1.5 x damage so if stable takes 100 damage 
and it uses Metal Burst, it will do 150 damage to the Pokemon that damaged it. Um, it's not a move that sees a lot of play, despite being an interesting concept, because, um, yeah, it's just not considered to be generally super strong. But it, in a format like this, especially with Zacian, like having the ability to Oko Zacian and Kyogre, or at least do a lot. Yeah, it should Oko, actually, based on Sableys base HP. Um, the ability to Oko those Pokemon out of Dynamax could definitely be interesting. So uh, I definitely see the vision there. Thank you for the explanation, because I actually forgot what Metal Burst does. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> does it have negative priority, too? Yes. Okay. Yeah, actually, I'm not sure about that. I thought the the other thing was that it doesn't. Yeah, you might be right. Actually, Good call. Yeah. Ah, so you can, like, take a hit and then use Prankster Metal Burst. That's actually really cool. But can you? I have no idea. Is it, does it count as a damaging move? Man, I'm confused. All right, uh, listeners, forget everything. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately for Kiwamu, the metal burst part was irrelevant. The fact that he even suggested Sableye was uh, a no go for him. <laughs> That's so funny. We tried Sableye at some point. I think we brought it to a Players' Cup, and I don't think that it went well. It went most poorly for me because I lost, and the other two of you qualified. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask Kinugawa-san what his favorite teams were. I mean, maybe the ones that we haven't gotten a chance to talk about yet or might not be so public, but like, yeah, what's your favorite? <laughs> that he's used? Yeah, or I mean, the the coolest stuff that he's used or like he thought it was really cool but didn't have a chance to bring it to a tournament. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so he says the after some thinking, the team that he has the most fond memories of is his team that got him to uh, qualify for the first Japan Nationals in 2017. And uh, this was the team that he kind of alluded to earlier that uses the Bulky Nihilego. Uh, mm. The mm-hmm. overall concept is uh, for the Bulky Nihilego to be able to get up a trick room and then use Choice Band Gigalit and um, Buzzwool in the back to just, you know, have hyper offense in Trick Room. Uh, he just felt like this was a really, really, you know, strong uh, tactic to use in the best of one format um, and was just really, really, uh, you know, cool that he was able to come up with something totally new and bulky in bulky Lego. Like, it was not really a thing until he used it. Um, and overall, just the fact that he was able to qualify for Japan Nationals for the first time made it really monumental for him. That makes a lot of sense. It's a cool team, too. Also, three Ultra Beasts is funny. Um <laughs> If I didn't know anything about the rest of the team, I would guess like Zergachi, Faramosa, Celestila. But <laughs> I guess my last question is, what are Kinugawa's goals like going forward, right? I feel like he um, obviously is focusing both on YouTube and on competing, which is something that I understand a little bit of, I would say. Um, and so I'm curious to hear like another top competitor and also YouTubers like goals like going into the next, let's say by Worlds 2023. Oh God, that's scary. By Worlds mm-hmm. 2023, like what is Kinugawa hoping to accomplish? So, this is my goal. Of course, in the competition, I can yeah, so he says that, plain and simple, he only has uh, his eye on winning the World Championships, so he definitely won't quit VGC until he accomplishes that. So that's what he'll go for this year as well. And as a YouTuber, uh, he just wants to get closer and closer to being, uh, you know, fully sustaining his life from YouTube. So he's really, uh, you know, focused on uh, increasing his subscriber count and his views, um, especially with the uh, release of Scarlet and Violet. Thank you very much. Those are great goals. And I relate. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I would just like to ask Kinugawa, like how he starts from making it t- his team. I think a lot of people start from different places. Like they analyze the meta and they say they, they really just want to have really good coverage of these specific things and then go from there. And I think other people say that they really want to go from a specific concept. So I think that's something I'd like to explore. But so this yeah, so he says that in general, like he follows kind of the two patterns that we just talked about, which is either kind of trying to counter the top uh, Pokemon or compositions that are relevant in a format, or also thinking of like your own, um, you know, really strong play and trying to get that through. Um, and those are over- overall the two uh, strategies that he employs when he comes up with his own team. But uh, especially in like Generation 8 in the Sword and Shield, era he's noticed that in the beginning of a format he would start with uh trying to counter uh you know the strong teams kind of with the former in general but as the uh, meta progresses and becomes a little bit more established he would go more towards kind of scouting out other teams that he sees like on like high ladder and uh trying to kind of take concepts that he feels are really strong and can kind of you know act in- independently of the meta and kind of like take that for himself and uh, put his own spin on it Got it. That makes a lot of sense. So I guess a follow-up that I want to ask, uh, I guess this is similar to some of the stuff that we have asked David Kotesh in the past, but 
when I work with newer players, they often say, I want to beat X Pokemon and then sort of focus on it. And the team that they build ends up not being so great. Do you know what I'm getting at, Wolf? I, th I think I know what you're saying. You're basically talking about how, like, it's knowing what you need to focus on while not tunneling on it, right? So, like, maybe in a vacuum, Milotic beats Incineroar, but Milotic doesn't beat Regieleki or Zacian or Kyogre even. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's the, it's the, like, how, how do you develop the knowledge of a Pokemon that is has a positive matchup against these top compositions without while still having general utility? Like, what is it that you look for? Is, is that is that a fair rephrasing of your question, Aaron? Yes, I think that that's a fair rephrasing. Yeah, I think that makes sense. So I'm, I'm curious what Kimiwa has to say about this. He tries to, if he has Pokemon that have extra space, that he uses that to counter like the specific team that he wants to beat. But yeah, he also agrees that like tunnel visioning on a specific matchup or Pokemon is not great. And that, uh, you know, usually if you have a solid team, uh, you don't really need to overinvest too many resources to beat one team. Um, so just like being conservative about like your resourcing on um, like how you build your team so that uh, you're just not over investing resources on just one team. Right. But if you have the extra space, once you've already built a great team, then you might as well do something like that. Yeah, I think that's what his approach is. Yeah, I think that's really smart. Like, like being aware of your remaining resources and then allocating them in the most efficient way possible. I think that's really smart. I think that's a great, a great place to end. We are running out of time here. So yes. First of all, thank you uh, to Kinugawa, of course, for coming on and being such a great guest. I personally feel like I've learned a lot from this. Um, and so I want to say thank you, uh, not only for being willing to share, but also, yeah, for just being so open and communicative about your process and and, and the like. Um, it's really cool to see an overlap between kind of uh, Japan and the English speaking part of uh, the world, just because it isn't something that we have that much experience with. So, yeah, I want to say a big thank you to Kinugawa first. <laughs> He says it was really fun for him as well. Awesome. And then, of course, a huge thank you to Yuki, um, our friend, uh, for coming on and being such a good, doing such a good job translating. This legitimately yes. would not be possible without you. So, um, yes. yeah, I just want to say really, really appreciate it. And appreciate you taking the time. And, and uh, yeah, it's it's been a really wonderful experience. And without your help, I my my Japanese probably wouldn't be good enough <laughs> to, to be of any use here. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Uh, something I you know personally really am invested in is a cause to you know kind of like like you kind of just alluded to to kind of get the Western and Japanese uh, you know, sort of hemispheres of Pokemon almost together. And uh, you know, I think I'm, I, this podcast is so well done from both of you. And I think it's a really great medium to do that. So I'm really hoping we can do more of these things with other Japanese players in the future. So thanks again for having me. Yeah, I would, yeah, I would love to. Um, yeah, I totally agree. Thank you so much, Kinugawa, for joining us today. Um, and you, Yuki, thank you as well. Um, but I feel like we'll see you again pretty soon. He says he also looks forward to seeing you soon. Just so the listeners can find you, Hinagawa-san, if they're interested in Japanese content, where should they go? YouTube. YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll link that. Okay, cool. Lastly, a huge thank you to Pedro Lima, as always, for audio editing and engineering, and to Eyeliner for the use of their song, Toy Dog. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.